Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Q La Trobe and Green Acres Golf Clubs, my name is Matthew Lochnane. I'm the host here tonight. Um, we have three amazing guest speakers over the next three or four weeks, leading off with the brilliant and talented Liesl Jones. Um, before we get to Liesl, uh, I've just got a quick housekeeping uh, thing that I want to put forward. Um, we do have questions at the end, so uh, we'll go for about 40 minutes and allow plenty of time for questions at the end. So there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your webinar screen there. So if you can leave the questions to right at the end, that'll be great. And then I'll be able to ask Lisa when we get to that particular point. But without further, any further ado, um, Lisa's achievements. She's won 10 Commonwealth gold medals and one silver medal. She's won seven golds, four silvers, and three bronze in the World Championships. Her Olympic medals include three golds, five silvers, and one bronze. She received the Order of Australia for service to sport as a gold medalist at the Athens 2004 Olympic Games in 2004. She was the World Swimmer of the Year in 2005 and 2006. She was also the Australian Swimmer of the Year in 2006 and was the Telstra People's Choice Award winner in that same year. In 2005, Liesl was inducted to the Sport Australia Hall of Fame. She's broken the world record four times, twice in the 100 metre breaststroke in 2003 and 2006, and also twice in the 200 metre breaststroke. On the 10th of July, 2004, for the entirety of three days to the 12th of July, 2004, and then in July, 2005 until August, 2008. Liesl Jones, welcome. Thank you very much. Before we get to your amazing career and uh, your amazing post career, firstly, with us Victorians down here in lockdown, you know, hating every moment of it, what's it like being up in Brisbane and actually being able to do something? Unfortunately, it's very lovely. Uh, it's very <laughs> difficult to, uh, to kind of put anything onto social media without feeling guilty. Um, I just saw Gian Rooney went on a holiday to Noosa and she copped it. So <laughs> um, it's very difficult. It's very hard because um, I guess, particularly in my industry, I'm almost uh, in considered the entertainment industry because I do a lot of corporate speaking. And so I don't know that corporate work is going to go back anytime soon. So yep. um, unfortunately, I'm kind of lumped in that group that, yeah, my work has, was pretty much finished in February was the last bit of work that I properly did. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's been a real challenge in that sense that there's a lot of people around the country that, um, you know, have completely lost their jobs. So yeah, particularly the entertainment industry. So that, that part's been challenging, but we are technically free. Um, Brilliant. But we're, we're allowed to do things that we want to do and we can, um, we can do certain things. So yeah, that, but that's been tough that we can't, you know, we feel so guilty. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll get to your amazing swimming career um, throughout this uh, next hour and also your post swimming career. But um, to kick us off, it'd be great to take us back to the start, you know, early uh, in your life. And, and were you one of those kids who were a sports prodigy, you know, was sport in your family? Uh, I'm just going to pop up some of your um, baby photos up here. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, but was, yeah, was sport in your family? Were you a sports prodigy? Did you um, get into the pool and, and were a star from the very start? Or was it oh, not particularly. No, I actually wasn't terribly sporty. So particularly going through primary school, I just, I really loved schooling. I loved going to school and I loved learning. And so I did a little bit of sport here and there, but I was certainly not a standout by any means. And um, like I, I would win things as a child, but not really, not really consistently. So yeah, it was swimming was the one that stuck. Everything else was very much uh, fell by the wayside. I was either asked to leave certain sports because I just wasn't very good at them or, or was maybe recommended that my mum didn't spend the money on the classes that we would that we were taking. So uh, money was pretty tight for me and, yep. and my mum growing up. So um, it was, I think, maybe just stick to swimming. If you're going to spend some money, maybe spend some money on swimming because it might actually get you somewhere. So, um, so that was quite interesting. But I did, I had the appreciation for all sports um, yep. through growing up. And um, I certainly was well aware of activity and being active and being outside. And I grew up on property. So um, I was always riding horses or 
Um, I had a cattle dog, so we would be outside all, all the time um, and racing bikes with the boys in the street. So I had no qualms about sort of competing against boys and doing and being competitive, but in, in particular sports, not necessarily. Yeah, sure. And you, uh, I read in your book, you had uh, what you uh, classified as a freakish hip glitch. What was <laughs> yeah. that? Well, and uh, so, that... Yeah, I was born with a twisted hip, which meant that I had very knocked knees. And of course, as a youngster, that's very embarrassing. And when your legs aren't particularly straight, and we, we actually had thoughts about maybe going to a doctor and, and getting them straightened and put, and put in braces and they'd have to be broken and, and things like that. And the only reason we didn't do it, and that picture highlights it there, just that sort of right knee, how it turns in so much. Yep. And the left one goes in a little bit, but the right one's worse. Um, yeah, that the only thing that stopped us was the cost. So, which is pretty incredible to think that I could have completely ruined my career as a child because, um, you know, it was a, a freakish sort mm -hmm. of um, bone issue that I had. And um, yeah, it, but it allowed me this unique sort of flexibility to be able to do things that a lot of people, other people and other breaststrokers couldn't do. And um, it certainly helped me later in my career. It was, it was definitely a strength and it was certainly something that I'm very grateful for because, yeah, it gave me a competitive edge that a lot yep. of other people were not privy to. Amazing. And your first um, first swimming lesson, that's got a pretty unique story as well. It was, <laughs> it was that horrible. Was the, yeah, that was the, the classifier sink or swim. What happened there? Yeah, well, um, so we learned to swim. So my first lesson was at Woi Woi Pool in Sydney and... Um, for some reason, I don't know why, in the 80s, early 90s, they learnt to swim with floaties on. I just think that's absurd. We, we certainly wouldn't do that now. But, um, yeah, we learnt to swim with floaties on. And then um, I was super confident. So I thought, oh, well, I can swim. And when we moved to Queensland, they didn't do that. They didn't teach that way. And so uh, I got chucked into the pool with the assumption that my mum probably told them that I could swim and I was very confident. And um, that was certainly not the case. So I sunk to the bottom and the teacher pulled me out and just sort of said, oh, um, you know, just leave her there. She'll be okay. She has to figure it out eventually. And I, I didn't really. So I got pulled out um, <laughs> yeah, pulled wow. up by the teacher, probably by the scruff of the neck and, <laughs> and pulled out. But um, yeah, I, it obviously didn't traumatize me too much because I went back. So um, yeah, it's, it's funny how that sort of happens. Like it's just, it wasn't, it was not the perfect start by any means. And um, it could have traumatized most people, but I was like, oh, well, I have to go back. I live in Queensland. Yeah. I have to learn yep. to swim. You have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when did you, um, when did you know that you were better than everyone else? When was it that, was uh, it, was it a real young age or was it more, you know, um, early, early teens, obviously you're at the Olympics. In yeah, 10, so well, funny it... enough, I didn't know I was that good until I made the Olympic team. So yeah, right. I was showing a little bit of promise about, uh, I think it was about three months earlier, we had age championships and they were in Perth. And that was really just to go over there. That was sort of like my big interstate trip that I had, I had ever done. I'd done state titles before that, but nothing really, um, mm -hmm. nothing major. And um, yeah, so we flew over to Perth and then I made the qualifying time easily for Olympics um, during the final, which was a huge PB for me. So it wasn't until then that I thought, oh, actually, well, I've made the qualifying time. I've just got to get first and second at nationals. And so... Mm -hmm. We just went from there. So I kind of didn't really know I was any good. I just kind of that year just really um, catapulted me a little bit further than everybody else. And it was, yep. I was on the scene and ready to go. So yeah, I certainly didn't think I was anything special before that. I just was pretty average really. Yeah. Right. And it, so you went quickly into the Olympic sort of scene, you know, you went from a dream to being a destination pretty, mm. pretty quickly. Um, how the uh, reading through your book that you were sort of qualifying for the pen packs and then all of a sudden, as you said, that you're in the Olympic trials and mm. everything was was um, was sort of going from there. I've got a uh, a quick photo here that I'd love to get your um, your thoughts on because yeah. I'm just sorry, I'm just sharing it now. So this photo of you. In the swimming trials in 2000, <laughs> yeah. um, there was a backstory um, that I read in regards to red fingernails and what was the peace sign, which uh, quickly went uh, into a victory sign <laughs> by the media, I believe. Uh, yeah. What was the story behind there? And, and, and also, you know, following that particular incident, how were you like with the media, you know, after that? Yeah. 
Yeah, it was really challenging because it's funny how media works and this was probably my first uh, taste of media and how they sort of flip things around. And um, it was really just a funny little joke between myself and one of my other teammates. And um, it was just like, oh, if you win, just flash like the peace sign at us and, and sort of like as a bit of a dare kind of thing. Yep. And then when I got out, you know, the, the red nail polish, I think that looks like it's blue or something, that one. It does a little bit, it but yeah. Blue. It might have been blue. Um, mm. But, yeah, I sort of would paint it all sort of different colours to relax me before the race. And um, Tanya McDonald and myself, she was my roommate. She was very similar age to me. Um, it was just a way of calming ourselves because we weren't allowed to walk down to the shops. Um, we were – our hotel was in, like, these apartment blocks in Bankstown in 2000, which was just hilarious. Um, and I guess could be considered, you know, very strange for a 14 year old girl to be walking down yep. to the shops by herself. So that was a bit off limits. Um, so yeah, we kind of just painted our nails to keep ourselves calm. But anyway, we, so I did that. And then, um, I got to an interview and I can't remember who did the interview, but they sort of said, Oh, was that like V for victory? And I was sort of like, Oh no, not really. Like that's no, it was just like a peace sign, but um, and but they decided that it was a V for victory, and then they ran with that. So even though right. I said no, it was just peace sign. Um, yep. And yeah, so it was just really strange that how things got twisted from that, and um, and I could see where it came from. Like it's not a case of you know they completely mi misconstrued yep. the truth or anything, but it was just a case of oh okay now I'm really wary about everything that I have to say in front of the media, and um, in case it's misinterpreted as something else, and. Um, there was one instance where, um, I can't remember what year it was, but it might've been after 2004. So I had just moved to Stefan and, um, I had just been talking about the, um, the Dalai Lama's book, the art of happiness. And I was just talking about how wonderful the book was. And the media said that I was now turning Buddhist and all this sort of <laughs> stuff. And I thought, look, if I could choose one, that would probably one that I might choose, but no, that's not the case. So um, <laughs> I just became really wary about everything that I had to say. Yep. And just in case they sort of took it and ran with it. And I was like, yeah, you just got to be really careful with everything. And, and that's where I was really super conscious about media and, um, and just how things could be really changed. Mm -hmm. but, but also I learned a lot about media too. So I'm very critical when I see anything on the media and um, yep. weirdly enough, this is completely off topic, but just watching <laughs> the Lindy Chamberlain story on the weekend, um just yeah trial by media which is really interesting so mm -hmm. yeah it's, i've got a very um very constrained view of what the, <laughs> what the media portray because i always wonder what the backstory is so at 14 what was it like to be suddenly in the media you know spotlight you're 14 you're going to your first olympics what was sydney like sydney was incredible um i don't know i don't remember a lot about it um probably because I was so young, there was so many, I was so limited with the things that I could and yep. couldn't do. And um, I just remember it being really overwhelming. And I remember, so Homebush now does not look like what it did at the Olympic games. It was a whole mm -hmm. nother section. So yep. the, the side that's quite short now is, was fully extended all the way to the back. And then the other side was extended again. And so just filled with people was just incredible to, mm -hmm. and they were all cheering for you. And, um, I obviously had no experience at Olympic Games before that. I had that was my first one, so I didn't know what to expect. Yep. But to have that pressure of a home Olympics and everyone cheering for you was something else. Um, very lucky. Very. Um, I consider myself incredibly lucky that I got to mm -hmm. compete at Sydney because it was truly something exceptional. And yep. um, a lot of my American friends um, who I competed against all say the same thing that Sydney was by far the best. And um you know just we really proved to the world just how laid back we are and, and how mm. much fun we can have and um it was so well organized and it was so um you know the volunteers made it a lot of fun and yeah yep. it just it really stands out in the minds of a lot of people um 20 years on which is pretty incredible did you you were 14 did you realistically think you could win like you nearly won i'll show the yeah, race in nearly. a minute yeah, yeah. Uh, megan kwan or megan gendrick as she is now um she was only 16, I think, at the time. So she wow. wasn't terribly much yep. older than me. Um, yep. So, yeah, for her, I didn't really take into account that it was even a possibility. I, I just didn't let myself go there. I didn't let myself think mm. too far ahead. And I just took it one race at a time and was just so grateful. Even if I just made it to a semi, I thought, oh, that's amazing. Now all I yep. have to do is make it to a final and then, <laughs> and then dress race. So it was really quite simple. And it was such a really, it was just a great way to think about things and, 
I kind of try and do that and I try and implement that into my life now yeah. in the way that just take it one step at a time. Just, you know, just deal with whatever's in your front, in your front of your face right now and, mm. and deal with that as best you can and then deal with the rest later because sometimes it may not go the way that you think it does and you'll be either disappointed or you'll yep. be facing a whole new challenge that you've already dealt with the other yeah, challenge, sure. but it's yep. totally different. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to play the race. This could be a little bit okay. clunky, so bear with me, everyone right. who's, uh, who's watching because I've taken it off to YouTube. But um, let me put the race up and see if we can, uh, if everyone can actually see it. Lisa Jones needs to give herself the opportunity here. She's in a good lane, lucky lane six, we say in Australia. And uh, she needs to go out a little bit harder if she's going to be in the hunt for the gold medal tonight. So impressive. Gotta love Dennis, Co uh, um, the commentator. What's his yeah. name? Um, Dennis, Dennis Comedy. Yeah. yeah. Lisa Jones, she's a little bit off the pace at the moment, and she's got a great finish. So come on, Lisa. Jones back fifth. White is seventh. In front, Haynes. The others Doesn't don't... look very positive from that position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You come, you come home hard here, though. <laughs> I think I know how it ends. Vegan Quan has gone up to Haynes. Haynes and Quan. Here comes Jones. Jones with White half a body length back. Jones is looming up as a middle contender. In front, Quan. Haynes is weakening. Jones with 10 metres to swim. Trying to claim them. Quan's in front. Jones is lunging. Quan in front. Gets there. Jones for silver. A magnificent swim by Liesl Jones. 15 years old. Olympic. Have a look at that baby face. <laughs> yeah, it's so little. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Just even to watch races like that, you sort of, yep. I don't watch them terribly often, but. But when you do, it's hard to believe that that's, that's the outcome. And it just goes to show you have really no control at the Olympic mm -hmm. Games. Just yep. really never turns out how you think it will. And, and the, the favourite or, you know, Penny Haynes is out in lane two, who was um, by far the most experienced athlete in that, in that crowd and, and mm -hmm. raced it um, probably not to her best. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, so you won, uh, you won a, two silvers in that um uh in that meet one one phrase that when i was uh, reading your book only recently that i wanted you to comment on was yeah full peeing etiquette what is that <laughs> uh yes well um depends because we got drug tested so often i would yeah. always hold it so yeah right. if, you, if you do get drug tested you want to be able to go straight away so that you can get rid of them quicker so yeah, they can right. leave you alone I didn't um, think that was actually a phrase, pool peeing etiquette, but yeah. I found that reading your book, it was. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it was funny because when the super suits came in, they were kind of like wetsuits. And so if you peed in them, they sort of, it sort of stayed in the suit. So um, that was probably a unique thing that people had to deal with. But yeah, most of the time, it sort of depends. Um, you kind of don't really want to pee in a suit because that does damage the material, um, which is pretty fine to begin with. So yeah, it's... Um, it's funny. I don't know. Boys don't really care, but yeah, it's, um, I don't know. It's sometimes also too, if you got out of the pool to go to the bathroom, it gave you an extra like five minutes oh, <laughs> to right. do something. So I kind of think that was a sneaky way of getting out of things. <laughs> yeah. um, and just in, so in 2003, you won your first world record. Mm -hmm. uh, was that right? In the hundred meters. And um, unfortunately you finished third in the final. I found an interesting story that the song that you were singing while you were, uh, were racing, is this, and I'll just, now this doesn't seem like a Liesl Jones sort of uh, person. I know though, what but it is. <laughs> is, this, is this right? Is yes, this what you were singing, it. Marilyn Manson, whilst you were breaking your first world record? In yeah, exactly. The Sweet Dreams. So uh, the Marilyn Manson version of Sweet Dreams, um, the Fleetwood Mac song. Um, yep. which is funny because I'm a huge Fleetwood Mac fan. So for, to choose that version over, over the original was a little bit strange, but, um, yeah, it was really funny just how something got stuck in your head and, um, you get a little bit distracted and then sort of you think, oh, that was kind of a good thing because then you don't overthink things. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it was kind of a good song to be able to sing, but it was quite funny, very disturbing Let's... picture, but typically, yeah. you know, um, I guess teenage angst, I guess, yeah. was listening to Marilyn Manson. But um, yes. I actually still like, I don't play it a lot, but I, I think his music's quite good. So let's um, hope all the kids are in bed. Otherwise, yeah. there's some, some nightmares coming <laughs> from that. Uh... person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah.
Um, and so moving on from there, Athens in uh, 2004, and before we get to, um, I guess, something that's really interesting um, and some comments made throughout the games, the, the village, uh, the, what was the village like? Because I think it was um, in, I remember, not back at the time, but sort of going through your book, the village was quite ordinary, wasn't it? it wasn't... In 2004, it was very ordinary. Yep. And in typical uh, Greek style, <clears throat> everything was really unfinished. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. No offence, but yeah, it was very, it was very funny. And it was just, and that's what made it great. And that's what made it one of probably the most fun Olympics because it was just comically unfinished. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, yep. you know, just in Greece, you're not allowed to flush uh, paper down the toilet. So you just naturally forget. It's just what you do at home. And so we would have people flushing toilet paper down and then blocking the toilet and then sewerage goes everywhere. And yeah, it was really quite comical, the things we had to deal with. And um, there'd be nails on pool deck. And so they were sort of like, you know, <laughs> oh, huge wow. nails and they'd be sticking up and, so you had to make sure that you always wore shoes and, and things like that. And um, it, I loved Athens in the way that it, it has so much history and was just one of the most, I think, fun Olympics. And we went to Mykonos yep. for a holiday afterwards, but comically just really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Every right. venue had some sort of issue. And um, I think we had a big dust storm one day where the, the whole pool was covered in dust. And yeah, it was just, um, I just loved it for that reason. And mm. um, it was very cool. I loved Greece. It was just unbelievable. Yep. But um, I'd love to go back there for a holiday. I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it as much as I, I should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, you, had a, you had a good games. Like you won um, bronze in the 100 and you won silver in the 200 and you won a medley gold. But yep. I just want to touch on quickly uh, Dawn Fraser's comments. Because <laughs> uh, I think her comments was poor attitude and a sport brat. Yep. Um, and... Um, so how, because I think you also quoted that you'll never ever again be myself in the public eye. How, how hard was it to deal with that? Yeah, um, it was really challenging. Time? Yeah, because like we said earlier, talking about um, media perception and quite often they take a photo and that's just the tiniest glimpse into what's happening at that point in time. And, yep. and admittedly, it was not the result that I wanted. I certainly thought that I was more than capable of winning the event or, mm -hmm. or at least getting silver because... Um, in the 100 breaststroke because I'd won silver four years earlier and I thought, well, yep. I'm smarter, I'm stronger, I'm bigger and um, and sort of know what to do. And I just put way too much pressure on myself. And so I think what made Dawn's comment so, um, I guess, challenging was that she didn't know me as a person. She, she'd never spoken to me before that um, and didn't really sort of make an effort to know what I was like or what I was going through and the amount of pressure that I was under to perform. And, and mind you, keep in mind, I was only 18 at that time. Yeah, so that's right. I was still exactly. pretty young yeah. um, to be competing on the world stage. And I just put so much pressure and expectation on myself to achieve and to perform for my country. And um, it didn't work in my favor. So I think that's what makes comments like that so hurtful is they, they usually come from people you don't know, who don't know mm -hmm. much about you and yeah. or don't understand the situation. So I think that's the hard thing. And that's why ever, if I'm ever doing any media stuff, I'm always making sure I don't comment on people that I don't really know um, or I don't know the situation. So um, because of that situation, I just don't know them as a person or what mm -hmm. they're going through. Um, yeah. Because behind the scenes, most of the time, those people are completely different to what they actually are portrayed. So yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's usually a glimpse in time that you, they show a photo and that's what people make assumptions of you based on that so um, yep. what they're told about you because you it, it, throughout that whole period like five six you dominated the the sport in yep. world champs and and everything but is it right that around 2007 you were thinking about retirement or was did i get that wrong from the... uh no i was probably wasn't thinking about retirement but i was very keen to go to 2008 because that was, yep. was when i felt most primed Yep. Um, but I felt I was just really struggling with getting back in the pool and training and, and that big sort of transition. And I was going through some relationship things at that point. And so, yeah, that's when I moved to uh, Melbourne and I trained with Rowan Taylor out at Bulleen. So yep. that was a really challenging time. And um, but I knew in my gut it was the right decision. And uh, to be honest, I don't know whether I would have won or not if I'd stayed in Queensland, but I certainly think that um, moving to Melbourne was probably the best choice that I made. And 
and, and working with Rowan gave me new insights, working with a different style of coach, um, very controversial yeah. coach at the time yeah. um, and, and didn't have any experience. So I sort of just went for it and went, you know what, this feels right for me and whatever I have to do, I'll have <laughs> yeah. to make it work because um, yeah. I don't really have a choice. And I've got to prove everyone wrong. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. it was kind of a good choice. So yeah, as much I was very fired up and was very keen to perform well in 2008 and um, I'm just very lucky that I made that decision. Yeah, and and it'd be remiss of me not to show. Uh, I've got quickly here um, just one, at least one of your your. Uh, I might be able to get it. Get it up here. Here we go. At least one of your um, world record swims <laughs> because this is pretty amazing. Uh, bear with me. Maybe not. We might keep that for, for later That's if right. I can, we can do it in the questions. We can <laughs> do it in the questions, exactly. Yep. So moving on to 2008 Beijing, um, so there was, up until that particular Olympics, there was really only one thing that you hadn't done before that, yep. which was win individual gold at the Olympics. You've done mm. everything else and, and dominated the, the sport for such a long period of time. Was there that added pressure? I know you're under pressure in 2004, but was there that added pressure in 2008 to do that one last thing that you hadn't done? Before? Yeah, absolutely. And it was a very unique pressure because I had felt public pressure and expectation before, but this was more so pressure for me. And it was proving to myself that I was capable of doing it and, and sort of a one last opportunity in my mind, that one last opportunity to get this done. I was really primed we'd been doing a whole lot of extra work behind the scenes we'd been working a lot on mental preparation for it um and so the the, the issue is it's a minute and five seconds to prove yeah. yourself so a lot mm. can go wrong in a minute and five seconds and a lot of people can outperform you on the day so i think that's probably the biggest challenge is you just can't control anyone else in that race you have to just try and get the best performance that you possibly can in a minute and five seconds and and just hope for the best. So um, I think that was the biggest part was just the expectation on myself that I need to do this because this is for me and I know that I'm capable of doing it and I'm probably not going to be here again. Yep. And um, yeah, there's nothing like that kind of pressure and, and the nerves that you feel before a race like that where you just, you just really hope like anything that it, it goes the way that you want it to because you've put in the extra work, you've done everything. And sometimes you've just got to let it happen on the day. Mm. And how did the race go for, it's from memory? Did, uh, did the race go exactly the way you thought it would go? or Yeah, you... it kind of was easy in the way that all those best races are easy and you sort of yeah. don't really feel anything. Um, and I don't remember a lot about the race itself. I remember turning, um, funny enough, and, um, and sort of feeling good. And we'd worked a lot on starts, turns and finishes, which is something that um, a lot of Americans work on. So, mm -hmm. um, and my coach had grown up in America and um, was really conscious of those sort of little skills. So for me, I had been working on those things and I just remembered that being really easy and just feeling pretty good towards the end. Like I could have kept going. Um, yeah. So I unfortunately don't remember a lot about it, but uh, yeah, yep. I just, I just remember it was good. Um, and just getting to the wall and just taking even a fraction of a second, just hoping that the number one was next to my name. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which sort of leads on to something I also want to ask you about, which is um, your uh, mental health. You've been mm. a huge advocate, you know, beyond, beyond Blue Ambassador, and you do a, a lot in that particular space. So I do want to get to that because I think it's mm. really interesting and really important. Yeah. Um, before we get to that, which you know, could lead into that um, conversation is the, the London games. Mm. And um, I think you labelled them at the time or, or post that the, the labelled the team as a toxic team. What, did, what does that mean? What, why were they toxic? And, you know, what were some of the examples of that? Yeah, well, just that team in particular, just the culture had really turned in a way that um, I just wasn't very proud of. And it was really hard for me because I had gone from, Sydney 2000, which was the most incredible team. It really was the golden era of swimming. We just had some of the biggest names. You had Kieran Perkins, Ian Thorpe, um, Michael Phelps was competing for the US, funny enough. He was only 16 or something. He didn't yep. really do too much in Sydney um, and just went on to dominate. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, we just had some of the most incredible swimmers on our team and it was just so positive. You just couldn't 
uh, it didn't matter if you had differences to people, you just got along and got the job done. And um, I just felt really out of control. I was the, I was the last standing member from 2000 and um, no one else was there to sort of back me up and, and say, this is, you know, uh, talking about culture. So yeah, it was really hard in that way that I just saw the results of what a toxic culture looks like and what can happen. And um, as you said, I'm, I'm big on, um, on mental health. And so I'm studying psychology at the moment. I'm doing organizational behavior and, and talking about culture and the importance of good culture. And um, it's just really quite incredible how poorly functioning teams and, and when culture goes out the window, just how much that affects outcomes and, um, and looking in a business sense, just profitability of businesses. So um, it's pretty incredible. The crossover is exactly the same. Um, when you go to work, there's obviously people that you don't like and, and wouldn't mm. choose to hang out with when you go um, yep. outside of work. And, and it's the same on teams. We travel with 60 people on the swim team alone. Um, that's a lot of people. <laughs> and so yeah, that's exactly. there's a lot of people with a lot of very different backgrounds. And so um, it's guaranteed you're not going to get along with everyone, but you've got a common goal and that's to achieve um, Olympic success. So yeah, mm. we it, to go from a team that was so successful and so... Um, cohesive and to move to a team that's quite fractured and um and the culture was very toxic was was very challenging and um it was very disappointing to see because i just saw how wonderful a good team is and then yeah. and then to see it to dissipate was really quite disappointing yeah and from reading your book i i, I see you didn't hold back a couple of times and <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and mentioned that to, <laughs> to some of the players that. <laughs> that they were potentially getting a, t a tad ahead of themselves which is fantastic yeah, well, I just, um, I just didn't want to stand for it. And if, yep. um, you know, if you, my old coach, Ken Wood, used to always say, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall. If you don't stand, for, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And um, I think that was a big thing. It just, you really had to stand up to what was happening at the time. And I think it was just really crucial to, to stamp it out. Otherwise it would have continued. And I knew I was retiring after London and I didn't want, I didn't want to see that continue um, after I had retired. I think I felt that, it was really important to stand up and say something. Yeah, do you have fond memories of the London Games? Being your last games, you went to four. Were they, they still hold fond memories or was it sort of clouded a little bit? Because of Yeah, it was, it was clouded a little bit, unfortunately. Yep. Um, I think Beijing and Athens were, were my two favourites. Um, Sydney was great, but I was too young to enjoy it, really. So, um, yeah, Beijing and Athens by far were the best. Um, I could actually really enjoy the game. So, yeah, it was a little bit of a shame that London just felt like it had a bit of a cloud hanging over it um, because yeah, it was my last Olympics and it was my final hurrah. And I had been around for, um, you know, over 12 years in the Olympic games scene and, and to have it finish like that was a little bit disappointing. Sorry, my two dogs, Banjo and Cody, want to ask you some questions. So <laughs> we'll get to the door a bit later. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't come in. <laughs> so uh, at that time um, there was an article on, and, and probably this leading into the mental health, um, stuff and and you your um, role in mental health these days and, and and what you've done since then. But there was an article in I think the Daily Mail in and around your body, uh, re two thousand and twelve. And mm. at that stage, you would have only still been in your mid twenties. Yeah. You know, what was how was that like to deal with, and how was you know going through that? Yeah, that was a really unique challenge and something that I never thought I would have to face throughout my career and. Um, that was probably my first taste of body image and um, people's criticisms of what you look like. And um, I think that's where, yeah, my passion of mental health had come into play because the year earlier, I was really struggling with depression. I was on antidepressants and was really struggling to train, was just um, really just, it was just a huge struggle and to come through that and to be even standing behind the blocks to still have made the Olympic team, which is hard enough as in itself in Australia, you have to be top two, but not only that, you have to be under a certain time, which is, I think the top eight, um, the median average of the, of the top eight or top 16 from um, the Olympics before. So it's an incredibly tough time to make. Um, so you have to be uh, like able to make a semi-final um, and yeah, you have to come one and two in the country. So in your race, so it's, it's not easy to huge make the effort, team. Yeah. yeah. It's a huge effort and it's not, it's, a, it's not easy by any means. It's not, it's not a holiday. It's not, um, we've got a lot of depth in this country and to be able to make the team alone is, is a challenge in itself. Um, and so for me to be there and to be told that, you know, I was taking a holiday and was not taking things seriously was pretty 
pretty hurtful because it just wasn't the case. And I was the first Australian swimmer to go to four Olympic games. And it, it's, there's a reason why it's hard to go for that long because right. yep. it's a really grueling and the training is incredibly hard and um, very tiresome and a lot of hours go into it. So there's a reason why I'm the only person so far that's been to four because it's just incredibly grueling. So it was pretty offensive to have someone make comments mm -hmm. about about my weight, which it's, it's just nothing about that. You, you look at the Olympic Games and you go through the Olympic Village, there's people of all different shapes and sizes. Yeah, exactly. One person can be doing one event and the same person doing the same event, they look completely different. So, um, yeah, it just it has nothing to do with that. And um, it was just disappointing that it went down that path. Yeah, so yeah, regarding your mental health journey, um, and you're obviously so passionate about... Um, about that and and a real a real advocate for normalizing mental health and what's yep. sort of been your mental health journey and and you know what do you do in that space now yeah well it's it's certainly something i'm very passionate about and i think during these covid times i think it's going to be of huge concern is is yep. the mental health of people and um you know i've seen a few statistics whether they've done what what sort of studies they've been done with um would be interesting but yeah, I think mental health is going to be one of the biggest things to come out of this. Um, and it's certainly something we have to keep an eye on. So um, for me, I'm, I'm in a really good place now. And so I feel really confident that I'm able to help other people. And um, I think that's a big thing. I have a lot of empathy for people who are going through tough times because I know what it feels like. And sometimes it feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel and, mm. and you feel like dark days are going to be forever. Yeah. And it's just not the case because once you get help and you get help early, you just need someone that untangles things for you to sometimes to be able to talk to someone and go, just let me unpack this or, or, or help me unpack what's going on. And um, it's really interesting. So yeah, I'm studying psychology at the moment and um, it's very fascinating, but I certainly want to be able to help people down the track. Um, not in, not in a clinical psych maybe, but um, more in organizational because that's really fascinating. And just that leadership and culture and teams and things like that is just super interesting. But Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mental health is something I'm super passionate about. I love helping um, anyone who's willing to listen. Um, yep. and, and I think there's just quite a few little tips and tricks and, and especially working with Beyond Blue, there's some wonderful um, things out there that you can do. I, I do a lot of headspace meditation, so yeah, a lot of well, those sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's just so many things that you can do. Yeah, awesome. Um, following your swimming career because you retired sort of in 2012 you've done a couple of, you've done some amazing things as well and of more recent times um some reality tv <laughs> what was what's uh, I'll, I'll i'll get to the full monty soon yes. but what was the um what was celebrity get me out of here in a jungle uh with merv hughes and i think yeah. barry hall and a whole range of different different beasts what was that like they were a lot of fun um and funny enough reality tv it's it's um Fraught with danger <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because yeah. um, especially if you go on something like the bachelor or the bachelorette or something, it's like, Oh, you just don't have any control over what, um, what they portray. But um, the celebrity was great. Um, it was really fun going into the jungle and you got to meet so many people that I wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to meet and people like Joel Creasy or, or Chrissy Swan or people that you might pass at an event, but not necessarily, um, get to be able to be friends with them or to muck around or mm -hmm. have a good time with them. Yep. So, um, so it was a really great experience. Unfortunately, I was the inaugural of the inaugural evictees. I'm the first. Oh, really? The first the entire oh. Australian season. That, that's something um, to hang your head on. Yeah, exactly. So I'm very competitive. I like being first. So, uh, <laughs> so it was good to be able to be the first person ever evicted from I'm a celebrity, but, um, I, I do feel I was ripped off because I think um, I think a lot of people were spelling my name wrong with the hashtag. They were spelling it L I E S E L. Oh, right, yes. L E I S E L. So I think I might have been ripped off there, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is uh, brilliant. I'll just pop this on. What convinced you to do this? <laughs> well, breast cancer and cancer in in any forms is super yep. super. You know, it's just across you. Everyone knows someone who's battled cancer or has mm -hmm. cancer or has beaten cancer or, um, and, and not just breast cancer, but um, prostate cancer as well. So it's, it was more about getting checked. And um, I didn't know who else was on the show, but I was really lucky because the cast were, were so incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just, I had, so, I saw the season before and it was just amazing. And um, 
Georgie Parker and Shane Jacobson had said that they were inundated on after the first season with people who did go and get checked and yep, right. fortunately or unfortunately found something and, and something came out of it. So um, it's, it's actually has a huge effect on people and I mm -hmm. didn't realize that. And so as soon as I did, I was like, yeah, definitely really keen to do it. Um, yeah. Everyone knows somebody that's been affected by cancer and if we can mm -hmm. catch it early, I think that makes a huge difference for people. So, um, and also it was really fun. Like it was just yeah. the most fun. It looks show. hilarious. Yes. Yeah. It was yep. really great. And behind the scenes, there was so much more laughter than, than what they actually showed. We were just laughing the entire time and um, it was really good. I really missed them so much. It was, it was just, <laughs> it was really such a highlight to be able to, to learn that and to, and to dance. So yeah, it was good. And obviously pre COVID because there was <laughs> yeah. like 300 people in the state theater <laughs> <laughs> all sitting next to each other. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of questions and, yep. and ev everyone who's uh, streaming in, um, as I said earlier, via the Q and A, uh, chat box at the front. If you want to, if you've got any questions for Lisa, please put them into that uh, um, particular chat box. I just received a uh, uh, a message um, saying that I hope Lisa realizes how much Australia loves her. She's so amazing. So <laughs> oh, that's you. come through on the phone. Um, oh, lovely! Thank is, you. Which is good. Um, but I had a couple of pre-submitted questions. Yep. Um, uh, one from Prue uh, Gifford, uh, Gifford Alice. Uh, indicated how did how did you handle defeat yeah defeat was probably one of the hardest things to deal with but funny enough it's the one that teaches you the most yep. and it's it's a bit of pill to swallow because you haven't probably achieved what you wanted to and then um, but there's so many things that you can learn from it and it's taking the learnings from defeat that makes you a better person makes you a stronger person um, shows weaknesses and things that you can work on afterwards so um, when we used to race, we used to um, go through sports science and, and look at the videos and, and assess it through, um, you know, velocity and things like that and stroke yeah. rate and, and stroke count. So um, it always gave us things that we could work on. And if you came from it from a scientific kind of background, it, it kind of took out the emotion from it. So it was a little bit easier to deal with because you're like, oh, okay, obviously, you know, my stroke rate was way too low. No wonder it, I didn't get the result I mm -hmm. wanted, but that's something yeah. we can work on next time. So. Um, I'm always grateful for the ones that defeat you were defeated by because yeah, you've got so much more to learn. And sometimes when the race goes absolutely perfect, where to from there? Yeah, um, sure. You, you yep. haven't got anything to improve. So those ones are probably the best and, and as much as they suck at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, now this is one from one of Q's directors, David Gunsberg, yep. um, asked a two part question and I'm not hundred percent sure of the second part series, okay. but um, <laughs> uh, why breaststroke? Yep. Um, and he's indicated that, uh, did you choose breaststroke because you don't have to tumble, but I'm sure you do. <laughs> well, you turn, you don't you tumble. Turn, turn. You don't yes. tumble. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. It's two hands and, and two feet on the wall. So mm. um, I think breaststroke chose me because of my twisted hip. So it was the yep. one that I was best at and it was the one that I was far better than everyone else at. So it's the one that I, that picked me, I think. Um, but it's funny because when you're when you do breaststroke, it makes you very good at medley. And so I was the national record holder for the 200 medley in about I think I was 2004, I think, or 2005. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, because the breaststroke leg is the one where a lot of people tend to drop back. And so if your breaststroke is strong, it tends to make everything else. And you can do butterfly as well. So um, so it was good stroke to pick. So yeah, mm -hmm. and breaststrokers are all a bit different and a bit special. So um, <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah, we're a bit different from everyone else. So everyone says that, and they always like to remind us too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I've got one, uh, a couple of more, actually a lot. Uh, how did you push yourself? This is from John Nelson. How did you push yourself when the pain kicked in? Yet you found the thing to go harder. Uh, I actually really like pain. <laughs> Ooh, I'm one of those <laughs> people that. Um, the more pain, the better. And um, I just loved pushing myself to the absolute limits and yep. it, it becomes really addictive to be, to see where you're at and how far you can go and how far you can push it. So that was probably helpful in my, and worked in my favor. And I've got a very high pain threshold. And yep. um, yeah, I think just, it was just, it becomes really addictive when, um, you know, you might be doing chin ups and you can do 36 kilos in, in a chin up and then you, you want to do more and you want to push more. So um, yeah, it just, the pain becomes like an addictive thing. You sort of feel like you're on the right path if it's a bit painful. So 
Um, but it sort of is a hindrance for me now because I go to the gym and if it's not painful, I feel like I'm not doing enough. It's <laughs> actually not the case. <laughs> yeah, right. um, uh, one last one for me. I've got a few more here. Your incredible smile and happy nature throughout your entire career. Was that because you were just so happy all the time? Was it, or was there a little bit of a mask put on um, throughout that time as well? Yeah. Oh, no, I think genuinely, I think um, a lot of people didn't get to see what behind the scenes, what I was really like. And I was probably yep. the real jokester behind the scenes. Yeah. And that was when I was on and when I was competing was probably the most serious I ever was. So I think probably people saw the really serious side of me and didn't see the joking side um, when I was at training and, and I'd be yep. always the one that doesn't take things seriously. Um, even in really serious situations, I don't take them very seriously. So yeah, yeah, um, I'm probably naturally a little bit like that. But yeah, when I was competing, that was by far the most serious I ever was in my mm -hmm. career and, and probably ever will be. Yeah, this next one's more of a statement more so than a question. Um, have done some marathons, but I always worry that you and Susie O'Neill were uh, media overanalyzed and not allowed to be your best. You've had yep. to watch your back, but from my position, you and Susie were much admired. I hope the media don't force brilliant athletes like yourself into the mental health space. You and Susie are brilliant. Step back, smile, and be immensely proud of who you are and what you have achieved. P.S. I hope you are well. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think media probably now more so than ever, I think the athletes become a little bit robotic and I think they say the answers that that sound right and they're probably the right thing to say and i think that's um it's a shame but yeah it's a lot of athletes are criticized for what they say and I, I wish that they could feel that they could say whatever they like and exactly how they feel without being criticized but unfortunately that's just not the case yeah um another one here how did you cope with what looks like loneliness of constant training and how did you prepare for long training sessions yeah, funny enough, swimming is an individual sport, but it's probably the most team and um, social sport that you can get. Um, we used to have a lot of fun and I really remember the times where we just laughed a lot at, in yep. training. Um, so it seems really lonely, but it's actually not. Um, yeah, and I used to travel around the world with my best mates all the time, competing mm. in different countries. Yep. And um, I just really remember all the good times. Um, obviously, we have tough days where, where you don't want to talk to people, but Yep. I just, yeah, I distinctly remember probably more times than not just laughing and just mucking around and being quite silly. So um, mm -hmm. I did not find it lonely at all. I think tennis would be incredibly lonely, but yep. swimming is definitely not. Yeah. Do you do you play other? This is another question. What sports do you now play? Do you play other sports? Um, I actually love tennis. Um, nice. I've been trying to get into golf. Um, I've got a Good. funny golf story. I was. Uh, I think just after the Olympics, I was just 15 and um, I was doing like a pro-am golf day. My husband doesn't let me live this down because he's a massive <laughs> golfer. And um, I was in a pro-am and so I was put into a team with um, a professional golfer and I, I had no idea who he was. And um, I told someone later, I was like, oh, he, he like had uh, like old in his name. So it was Peter Senior. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a golf thing with Peter Senior and people just kill me for it. They're just like, I'll never let you lift that down. Like the most incredible golfer we've ever seen. And I was lucky enough to be in his team and I didn't even appreciate it. Oh, well, Karen Perkins fobbed you off at some stage too, didn't he? Wasn't there a story regarding you wanting to get an autograph or something from Karen Oh, Perkins? yes. I asked Karen Perkins for an autograph and he declined. <laughs> oh, no. Now he'll devastated. be asking for your... your yeah, that's it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple more questions. Um, another question. Uh, I'm so proud of you. Is it early? Is a starting statement? Can you give some advice to my sport mad granddaughter about enjoying every minute of sport she's involved in? Yeah, it, it is really about enjoyment, and I think as soon as you're not enjoying it, that's probably the time to give it away. But it, you do. There are some elements where you kind of have to push through things, and and sometimes, and in life in general, things are just not that enjoyable, and um, it depends what your goals are and how committed you are to making them happen. But I think the best thing for kids and, and really anyone is just try everything and, mm -hmm. uh, and see what sticks. And, um, and if the people in the group are good, like if you've got good friends there, I think that's always a nice reason to stay in different sports. But um, it, I think it's just great to try all of them, even just really random sports and, and something might stick. But I think sport is something you can do for life and it's such a great skill to be able to pick up because yeah, it just, you can do it for the rest of your life and it keeps you so fit and healthy and it's a great way to stay social as well. So um, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, nice. This one's, we came in earlier from Brendan Waddy. Um, 
It says, what were your highlights of Sydney 2000, both at a personal level and more interesting as a fresh face 15 year old Team Australia member? That's not all. Yeah, um, I don't remember a lot about Sydney 2000, but I do remember um, Macca's cookies were like the nice. thing I was excited about, um, which is so, I don't even know if they make Macca's cookies anymore, <laughs> uh, but I do remember eating a lot of them. And um, yeah, I, I just remembered that there wasn't a lot that I could do um, because I was 15 and I was on the front page of nearly every paper in the country. Um, all the security guards knew that I was 15 as well. So I couldn't even try and sneak in every, anywhere. It was just, yeah. I would have been in so much trouble. <laughs> um, so I do remember being, it was a bit of a struggle the second week. Um, but I did, I remember sitting behind um, John Howard in at Kathy Freeman on the finish line, just watching her in the 400. So oh, wow. that was absolutely incredible. It's moments like that, that oh, it mm -hmm. still gives, gives me goosebumps. It's yep. just the most incredible moment. And to be there is just absolutely phenomenal. Like it just blows my mind that I got to be there and to witness that in the flesh. It was great. Yeah, that's brilliant. This one's a two-parter, which is from two different people. Uh, one, uh, is from Jenny Cribb it says, do you still swim now for exercise? And the second part is, why do swimmers train so early in the morning? Yeah, um, I don't swim now. I do everything I possibly can <laughs> to stay dry. Um, it is, it's a wonderful sport though, and it is so good uh, for social swimming. And uh, I know some swimmers go back now because it is, it's just really good on your joints. It's just, it's not as hard on your joints and it's great cardio fitness. So maybe one day, and because I'm in Brisbane, it's really great um, sunshine. You get a really good tan. Which is good. <laughs> um, so maybe one day, but swimmers start really early because majority of them are still working and a lot of them either go to school or uni. So you need to get a yep. two hour session in before you go to school or uni. Um, and so, yeah, typically we need to start by five to be finished by seven. Then you have some lunch and then you get to school, have a shower and go to school. Sure. So, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 So you need to start early. Whereas we're not, we didn't really have the luxury like AFL players to, to play during the day or anything like that. And usually the kids are really young, so they're still at school. Usually that's why. Yeah. Um, this is a really good question. We've only got a couple of more questions. Um, which gave you the most joy, the team relay gold or winning the individual gold in Beijing? Um, that is a really great question. That is a good I would, question. Yeah, I would say um, winning individual gold is very um, satisfying for me personally. Um, but the most fun I had was the, was the relay gold because you get to share that with other people. And um, it just highlights how a team effort and, and people come together and there's just so many more elements that come together for a relay gold yep. and there's so much more that you have to overcome but we were so dominant especially the the females in in relays um, the Americans have always been incredible that was the one thing that they always hung their hat on was was their relay um, championships and um, and we beat them nearly every time so it, that was really satisfying as well yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a really great friendly rivalry. So I love them both for different reasons. Um, yeah, personally, very satisfying when you get an individual because a lot of pressure on you, um, yep. but the relay is just fun. Yep. And two more to go. Did any swimmers really stand out as exceptional in the mind? Uh, for mental toughness, I'm yes. assuming. Yes. yes. Um, I think Michael Phelps was pretty incredible in the way that he was able to back it up from race to race. And sometimes he would have three races in a night, which just blew my mind because it's mm -hmm. so exhausting. And, and to have, be able to have that focus and to flip back and forward from different races, which required different preparations. And that, that blew my mind in just the way. And he was just so relaxed and calm about everything. Um, yeah, he was pretty incredible to watch um, from an athlete's perspective. Yeah. And... Uh, two to go. Uh, later on, did you develop a better relationship with Dawn Fraser? <laughs> no, she still doesn't talk to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, even at events, she won't come up and speak to me. I don't know why. <laughs> she still doesn't like me. That's all right. And then there's a few other just really nice comments. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, we got from, yeah. Um, 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 And I think that is... Oh, uh, one, see, please explain why both your hairstyles look so good considering it's the COVID-19 restrictions. We'll take that <laughs> both as a compliment. Um, I'm allowed and, to go to hairdressers, so that's yeah, why. That's right. But I do this myself. <laughs> um, and that, I think, is, is it. So 
Yes, thank you. On behalf of, um, let's uh, sort of 8.26 now, so a big, big thank you in the questions and some texts coming through on my mobile uh, saying how much they loved listening oh, to good. you, loved your stories, yeah. Yeah. loved everything. It was great. A really big thank you on behalf Over. of the yeah. Golf Club, um, Latrobe, Golf, Latrobe Golf Club and uh, Green Acres Golf Club. Um, you are the first of a three parts. You know, <laughs> it is awesome. If this didn't go well, the other two probably wouldn't happen. So yeah, then they'll blame well. me. They'll be yeah. like, why did you ruin it for me? Seriously. Um, but, but yeah, when COVID's finished, I really want to get, I said to my husband, I really want to get into golf and start learning. I did do a few lessons, but um, I think it's such a wonderful sport to do. So yeah, I need to get into it. So when You've I got, come back to Melbourne, when we've got we're, three we're, great we're, clubs there waiting to take, uh, yeah, take you on awesome. board as an ambassador. Yeah, but, as long as Peter Senior is not there and I don't embarrass <laughs> myself. <laughs> but um, just to, to wrap up, we do have um, next week. So next Wednesday at 7.30, we've got Dan Kieran, who's a Victoria Cross um, medal winner. Um, Bill, the general manager from La Trobe Golf Club, will take over the host chair and be interviewing Dan. So please, if you haven't registered for that, um, log in for next week. Once again, a huge thank you, for Lisa. Um, it was brilliant. I loved hearing about all the different stories and about your life. So thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Enjoy thank next you. week. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it should be good. I'll send Very you all cool. in. You can listen. Yes, I'll love. I'll be in there. I'll be. I'll ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. All right. Thank you. See you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.